Hi everyone, once again we're at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History with the Zoology Collection Manager Mark Carnell. So today we're going to talk about something that has always fascinated me and that is the idea of a type specimen. These are really important to someone like you, aren't they Mark? What is a type specimen? Okay, so I've got some here, so I'll just pop this one over. So this is a type specimen of a pharaoh cuttlefish. It's the type it's specimen. It's the type specimen. And in museums, normally if you see either red tape or red mark on a label, that refers to the fact that it's a type specimen. So if you were on field work and you caught a cuttlefish, you had a look at its anatomy, its soft tissue, the number of suckers, etc. It doesn't quite match anything that's been published before. You have the opportunity to describe that as a new species. So that's the idea behind a type specimen, is that the type specimen is the original description. And you keep it, it becomes like the template or the model by which all others are judged to say, is this just more of the same or is this something new? Yes. And in theory, if people are publishing or looking at related groups, they need to refer back to the type specimen. But we get thousands of researchers a year who come to the museum specifically to see type specimens. And we also send images or loan specimens to other institutions so people can do that, what we call alpha taxonomy work. So this cuttlefish from Singapore in 1896 yep. is a type specimen. We can see now, we know to look for the red label. So you think, wow, these must be really special. They are really special. So have a look at this. Mark's got a whole cupboard <laughs> just of type specimens. Look at all those red labels. So this is just the selection for the Invertebrate Spirit Store. We have other type series in the dry collections and the entomology collections and even the fossil collections. So this concept of type is really, really important across biological sciences. And these specimens get used a lot more than the others for this kind of taxonomic research. The thing about type specimens that always captures my imagination is that they were just some animal minding its own business, not knowing that they were going to end up in history, you know, preserved for all time as like the model of their species. I feel like they're kind of unfortunate in a way, but they're also fortunate, <laughs> aren't they? Yeah, it's, it's a really bizarre concept and one that we try to get over to people when we're talking about the importance of museum collections. Mark, can we have a look at a few of these type specimens? Because they're, they're like celebrities to me. I want to have a closer look. Yeah, so uh, we've got a real diversity uh, of different kinds of type specimens and some of these we're still kind of researching to work out the type status. No red label on this one yet. That's because we've got to chase up this description here. So this is the only record we've got that might be a type specimen. Is this brackets type specimen. This is type specimen question mark. We do a lot of research to try and work out whether it is A type, B type or part of the type series. It's a gorgeous specimen. It's a really it? nice, yeah, it's a really nice um, Spongodi specimen, which is a, a kind of sponge. Spongodi. Oh, I don't even, I've never heard of that. Got this really nice Peripatus, which I think is a velvet worm. It's a really strange group of animals called velvet worms. They look like other kinds of worms, but they're their own kind of thing. So there's a nice species of those. Again, there was just this one velvet worm minding its own business one day, not knowing it was being plucked from obscurity. Yeah. Another nice large one is this glass sponge. Um, wow. It's a Euplectella. So they're called glass sponges, and you can see that this one's heavily labelled with do not be used for class demonstration. So obviously we're a university museum, so a lot of this collection was used in teaching, but type specimens weren't the ones to be kind of used in that teaching material. We say they're glass sponges because they're a skeleton that's made out of glass, or we say they're made out of glass. Sadly, for some groups of organisms, we no longer have kind of an expertise, perhaps in this country, perhaps at a continent level, and other areas are always of perpetual interest. So botany and insects tend to be of constant interest because of their role in ecosystems, agriculture, pests, etc. When it comes to some of the more obscure groups, sadly, we've lost that kind of expertise. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah. If someone came up to you and said, Mark, we've, we've appreciated some of the work you've done here, <laughs> When you pass on, we want to make you the type specimen and preserve you in a museum. Yeah. Would you would you accept? Would you say I'm willing to do it? I don't know. It's, uh, it's when you look at this, when you on. like, yeah. do you look at this Hall of Fame and think, oh, I'd like to join their ranks, or do you think it's a bit of a sad fate? <laughs> not what I mean, for me, the, the biologist in, in biologist in me is thinking that perhaps I'm not a very good representative for the human race. So I'm slightly taller than normal. <laughs> it's taller than normal, you know, uh, uh, perhaps wear glasses, uh, so no, I'd go, I'd go, f um, if we were, we were look hunting for a new type specimen for humans, uh, I'd try to get something that's a little bit more representative than my freakish proportions. Maybe. <laughs> we'll see. He doesn't seem convinced. <laughs> This episode of Objectivity was brought to you by 23andMe, the online genetic service that will help you learn what the 23 pairs of chromosomes that make up your DNA can teach you about your ancestry, traits, and health. If you'd like to help with scientific research and discoveries, or just learn your own personal DNA story, 
go to 23andMe.com slash objectivity.